This is part one of a two-part series with my guest Carl Terry discussing the history of Roosevelt County. Make sure and tune in next week for part two. From the studios of KENW on the campus of Eastern New Mexico University, it's You Should Know, featuring the people and events of Eastern New Mexico and West Texas. Welcome to You Should Know. I'm your host, Evelyn Ledbetter, and my guest today is a longtime resident of Roosevelt County, Carl Terry. Carl, thanks for joining me this morning. You're welcome. Oh, Good you, to be here. You've been here a couple of days. A couple of days? Yeah. Well, I, actually, I, I, I grew up here. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. You've, you've been part of this county forever. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about your background. Well, I, I uh, grew up on a, on a farm here in Portales, and uh, uh, my, my, both my grandparents were farmers, and, and going back to my, my grandmother's side, you know, they were, she, she lived in a dugout. And on the on the other side, uh, my great grandmother died on a homestead oh, uh, after childbirth. So I mean, we got kind of got roots in the in the uh, this this area. And uh, I uh, grew up on the farm, but we moved to to town and uh, when I was about ten. Okay. My dad stayed in the the uh, uh, custom harvesting business, so we were out on the farms a lot uh, and worked with him a little bit. Uh, in high school, and then after af after I was grown, I I got into the, I started in the newspaper business after I moved to town uh, as a newspaper carrier, and and then uh, you know I, I was there uh, at the time of Gordon Greaves and Marshall Stennett, uh, and they hired me uh, at eleven. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was a year younger than they were supposed to. I was supposed to be for a paper boy, and, <laughs> and uh, went on uh, stayed and worked my way through the mailing room and press room and eventually advertising and the news side uh, at, at uh, Tucumcari and, and uh, became a publisher okay. uh, first in, in Tucumcari Weekly and went on to from there to publish a, a daily newspaper in, in South Texas and Bay City and then worked at several uh, weeklies in Colorado and even uh, was involved in a startup of a, of a daily newspaper. Wow there in Colorado as well. So started out, you were getting up at what, four in the morning and wrapping papers or how? <laughs> uh, well, we only had one one day a week that we, you know, Sunday mornings that we had morning delivery. Oh, that's at that true. time it was an evening delivery. That's right. So it was after school. Um, uh, we went directly to the newspaper office and and uh, got the papers out. I started, the route I started was all the way out uh, by the uh, uh, college. And so I I had to pedal out there and then back across town every day. <laughs> you know, so many changes in in the newspaper where it was six days a week and yeah. and literally down to to two day three days a week, yeah. I guess now. So and then I uh, when I came back to Portales um, in two thousand five, uh, I I uh, eventually uh, was led to the to the to a career at the chamber, and I was at the chamber for eleven years, uh, starting in two thousand eleven. And I uh, totally enjoyed that. That was a, a lot like being a newspaper publisher. You were in the middle of things and that's true. And involved in, in, in the growth of your town. Well, and when I got to know you a little bit more was went through the Leadership Portalis program mm -hmm. and, and the history and things that you knew about the, the county and, and the town and even surrounding communities. I learned things and I've lived here my whole life. Yeah. So well, I've had a I've had an interest in history. I'm not a historian uh, uh, and not trained there at all or educated there at all, but I enjoy enjoy reading and, and uh, learning more about history. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do when we launched Leadership Portalis was that I wanted to make sure that we uh, imparted our history, the history of our community to the those that were going through the, the, the group. And, right. And uh, so I, I took it on myself just to make sure that that that, that was done. And so I, I directed and led a lot of the, the programs uh, in, in the startup of that. Well, there's a, it's a vast history, you know, and, yeah. and I don't know. And when your family homesteaded, do you know the year? Uh, kind of close to. Well, my my um, the, the Kennedy side, my my grandmother's on my paternal side, uh, settled in Arch, but they had they bought a homestead. Um, they were the second owners of the of the place in Arch, and and uh, 
it it stayed in the family that place for a long time we would just it was the arch place right <laughs> it right. is what it was referred to and and they lived uh, when they first got there in a dugout and uh, my my grand great grandfather granddaddy Kennedy he said he was what he was looking for when he got off the train in Clovis he bought a he had a then bought a Model T and they toured the countryside and and what he was looking for was shallow water <laughs> and and no Johnson grass <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, my grandmother's recollection she says I didn't know exactly what that Johnson grass meant but she said I found out later she, she learned real quick <laughs> didn't she well, that, well, that was not a good thing <laughs> no 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 that takes over a crop and, yeah. and my family homesteaded around mill and sand and covered wagon and same thing they lived yeah. in a hole in the ground a dugout and Tough times. <laughs> uh, so you've put together, I know you've, uh, we've been in Rotary together and you do a lot of presentations on the county and, and different things. And, and I'll kind of debate with you. I think you are a pretty good historian. I think you know as much as, as you and Betty Williamson <laughs> know a ton about it. And, and Trish Greaves, and, or not, know, not Greaves and anymore. Betty might, might have a better background than, uh, than, than me. I don't know. Well, well, let's start in. So well, you you I, have an interesting talk. What I what I uh, one of the things I arrived at with the leadership group was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I got to, and, and I, I'd done two different books uh, for the newspaper. After I left the newspaper, they um, got me to freelance on the centennial for Portalis. Uh, in in uh, two thousand nine, I did the the intro okay. to that. And in that book, which is the one over there, oh, and okay. um, then I also uh, later did a uh, one for Clovis. Very nice. And uh, I didn't play quite as. I had a couple of sections in that book that I authored, and and uh, so as I was doing that, I you know I was struck by, you know, the two things about the way Portalis grew that that really struck me were the fact that you know it it, it hinged on water. And it hinged on, we, we, we had a, a history <laughs> of, of um, uh, wet and dry faction as far as alcohol right. was concerned. And, uh, and it was really, when I learned some of it, I'm going, wow, this it, has been going on a long time. And so I, I titled the, the to topic, uh, Whiskey and Water, How Portalis Evolved. <laughs> it and was a pretty what, rowdy town. Yeah. It, well, you got to, you know, going back to, uh, let's talk about the water. That's what we're going to do here is talk a little bit about the water. The the water, I mean, goes back 13,000 years. Sure. We, we were hunting bison and, and uh, mammoth uh, just just to the uh, uh, north of here at uh, Blackwater Draw. And that was, that was pretty pivotal about why man was here. Uh, later, mm -hmm. we were here on the, on the uh, earth, uh, in this area, because of the Portalis Springs, right, and uh, because your animals typically follow water, yeah, and so there, there were, you know, the the buffalo hunters that the Indians knew about the uh, the uh, springs, and they used that uh, on their passing across the country, and they hunted in the area uh, mm -hmm. for uh, buffalo and pronghorn, and then the buffalo hunters knew about it, and uh, uh, George Cosy. Um, got he he uh, probably made the first road uh, through the area by uh, um, heavy oxen team that was pulling hides and and meat to oh. Fort Sumner in Las Vegas, and so they called it the Portalis Road. Uh, he he his headquarters were at the Yellow House and uh, near Lubba. There in Littlefield, near right? Where uh, Littlefield is, mm -hmm. and um, so that that road became. Uh, known and, and traveled because they knew there were, was water that trade at route. Portalis Springs and then water then uh, just south of Melrose at what they called the Tulis and then that was th then you could go on to the to the Pecos and, and go up to Pecos. Now that's new to me. Um, the Portalis Springs, that's actually how Portalis was named. Yeah, correct. And that's where we take our name. Is from Portalis? And the, the reason it, it's named uh, uh, Portalis was because it, it, look, it uh, resembled uh, a Mexican hacienda mm -hmm. with the porches out front. Uh, kind of called, that overhang. Uh, there was overhang in, in a caliche escarpment out there. And it's you can kind of use your imagination. It's roaded off and not not quite like that today, but the, the, there was a spring uh, coming out of that 
that those caves and and so they they look like the porches of a, a, a Spanish hacienda, and, and this, they called them portales. Portales, and this is actually when you go east of Portales towards right. Arch. There's still a sign there yeah. that says the side. The Wines Club signed it uh, 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 several years ago, and so it's it's a little hard to to find, and it, you wouldn't think looking at it, you're going that, uh, but there's you know a little bit of a cave there, and you know this is reputed that Billy the Billy the Kid hung out at yeah, I had Cal a... He would drive uh, cows that he stolen, <laughs> water them there, and then take them on uh, onto the uh, Tascosa area, and uh, you know that was. That was uh, one of the legends, and there's legends that that he might have stopped there. That might have been his last stop before he, his death and before Fort his demise. His he, his last ride could have been between mm. Fortalis Springs and Fort Sumner. So that was actually a trade route. So coming yeah. from Little House and then through yeah, Fortalis. to some degree. I mean, there was not a lot of lot going on at that time, but to some degree there was that. And there was there was even uh, you know, there were, there were uh, a couple of uh, different uh people that were uh you know staked out the water hole mm -hmm. as as they're they're uh uh to, to water their cattle down and and so that that had a little bit to a little on. bit of, uh, a little bit of contingency a little of, bit of who owned that a little bit of contention there um uh dope good was the first gentleman to you know claim that water hole and he had he had a little bit of a uh, trouble with other uh, cattlemen that, uh, and, and he eventually left that. But uh, was he encouraged to leave? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but there were other, the other factors as well. But uh, he he eventually did leave, and the 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 guy that uh, with the DZ that Jim Newman, uh, he uh, he eventually uh, took the that and and operated there for a while. Well, the thought was it was actually an artesian spring, right? Like, uh, it, like more, or it was, was actually it? flowing. Now, okay. And so, that, that, I'm going to get into okay. what, I'm jumping artesian ahead. stuff a little bit later here. But, um, uh, so there, and there was a, a store, uh, at one point at the Salt Lakes and, and Portala Springs, uh, near that area, because there was some ranching activity in that area. And, uh, a fellow by the name of Josh Morrison, uh, he was known as uncle Josh. Uh, and he, Whenever uh, Portalis, uh, this was just prior to the turn of the century, 1898, they, they began to, to, to build the uh, Pecos Valley and Northeastern Railroad. Uh, it was called the, the Peavine. It, huh. it came up from Pecos to Roswell, and that was when the railroad came into the area. And John, Uncle Josh looked at where the railroad was coming through and says, I got to be there. And so he, he hooked a team onto the uh, to the put his, put his store up on uh, sleds and hooked a team to the <laughs> to his wagon and and drug the the uh, store to Portales and became the first merchant in Portales. So he he was following the water and then the railroad, which you know, of course the railroad the first Sorry. thing they got to here they had to find water and and right. they did it uh, by by drilling well and and getting uh, uh, a, a windmill set up and uh, early on. Whenever Portales was formed, uh, there are pictures uh, uh, of uh, drilling on the courthouse square. I've seen. And, yeah, uh, I've actually they had, seen actually had a, uh, a a well down on the courthouse square with a tank, and and so that people come down and, and so they would literally go there to get water. Uh, like a, yeah, like they, a community there were also spot. what they called wagon yards. So if, if homesteaders were coming in, they would they would stay overnight sometimes at the wagon yard. And they could water and board their livestock there while they were, while they were shopping and visiting and and uh, having a had a having a time in the in the big town. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, and and I think you said that you know to drill a well was extremely yeah, it was ex expensive. It was expensive, and uh, you know, so Portales grew, uh, you know, kind of on the on the dream that that uh, we had we probably had. Uh, shallow water mm -hmm. and uh, so we the the county uh we, we were, it was this was in territorial days uh mm -hmm. 1903 the county was formed and and washington ellsworth lindsay the the guy on the on mm -hmm. the, his uh statues on the square right uh he was he was pretty instrumental in in getting the county and, and he was a he was a, a land 
um, master for the for U.S. Uh, uh, land uh, commissioner, and so he was uh, he helped uh, assign the the uh, homesteads when folks come to the area. Really instrumental and so he, into growing he was the area. Trained, he was trained as a lawyer, mm -hmm. so he he was what really was our you know one of our main town fa fathers, and and he started you know just by by getting stuff through the territorial uh, legislation to, to get the, the uh, uh, county started. Then right. uh, the, the, the area grew from about 350 to 3,000 from that. 1900 to 1904. That's a crazy then, amount of growth. Then by 1910, uh, right after uh, the incorporation, it was twelve thousand, and we're, we're not. And that's that, almost what yeah, we that, are now. That's what struck but, me when I was reading through all the know, information. It, it, and so, yeah, you think about Charles. We just, we've just we've we've held our own right uh, all this time, uh, despite you know different trials and tribulations. And so, um, one of the things that that drew that spurred that growth was the you know the Homestead Act. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of a lot of folks now that the 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 railroad was here. Uh, they were. It was easy for them to to you know. They knew they could ship goods uh, and and uh, product back out. So the the farmers were were uh, you know starting to come in and and they were being drawn in by you know well, town was, fathers and the railroad. I uh, was going to ask. Boosterism is what they called it. I always wondered how my relatives from Tennessee knew to come here, but I guess they were putting out flyers and advertising. They were, they were advertising it in free uh, land. But yeah, it was free land. I mean, you had to homestead it and uh, you could get the 160 acres. You, you just had to, to live on, on the land for five years, uh, and, and do improvements to it. And, and then you, then you own, you, you own land. And that, that was very attractive to the folks. And, sure. and they, they, uh, uh, you know, would show pictures of, uh, uh you know, the best Good of the crops, best, the best of the best, and and they they uh, um, advertise as as the 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 inland valley and the land of the underground rain. <laughs> you know, they may may sound like it was pretty easy to get water, and in some areas at that time it was uh, you could dig a, a hand well, right? But other areas not so much. And you know, uh, one of the one of the stories that I I talk about. Uh, uh, with that leadership tour was uh, uh, in the uh, the book uh, Six Miles to the Windmill. I have read that. Which uh, it really uh, shows you how important uh, the uh, uh, having water oh. on a homestead was. Well, I know when I read that, um, and this was the Greaves family. Yeah, it was. And, it, it was. And she came out. J.G. Spud Greaves, sixteen years old. She comes she, out for her to meet her husband, and takes a wagon. Right. Yeah. Gets a ride with a wagon out to their homestead and no one's no there. No one's there. And she spends the first night on the homestead with the coyotes howling all around her. And a new with baby. A, with, a with a young baby. baby. And yeah. uh, so that was, it, she was not, in the book it says, you know, it wasn't her idea of what she wanted. She wanted to be a school teacher and, and, uh, living she, in a, yeah, she, she had no idea. She'd never been on the far, on a farm and, and he showed up, uh, just before daylight with the wagon and she ran out to meet him and, but had no idea if he was even alive. Yeah. It was just out yeah. like a 70. How but, will I even get back to, to Elida? To, yeah. So. Uh, this was in the Kenna area. And uh, she got off the train in Kenna. And the the book is titled Six Miles of the Windmill. And it was uh, actually her notes, uh, Annie C King Greaves' notes uh, that, that Gordon eventually put into that book. And uh, so it, uh, it detailed... Uh, you know their struggles, and the first struggle was they they had to haul water right to to uh, uh, water livestock and and plant a garden. Uh, so they and the nearest water was uh, six miles away <sighs> at a windmill and, and hauling that back. So and they to water. twice a week they hauled water by wagon team, and then they tried to farm the other uh, other days of the week. And so it got to be a lot, and you know they had of course. Trials and tribulations right. with the the crop, and he was trained as a printer and, and newspaper guy, and and uh, so he eventually went went to town and got work 
uh, you know, doing that. And uh, so she was on the farm a lot on her own. And, yeah. And that kind of touches me. With, I, I, my my, uh, my uh, folks on my other side, my mother's side of the family, homesteaded at, at uh, Fort Sumner. And okay. she died a- after a miscarriage on the alone on the homestead. Uh, great-grandfather was here in Portales working as a barber and uh my my grandmother rode on horseback for a, a doctor and yeah. didn't come quick enough so that's kind of some of the well my grandmother had all five of my my mom and her four siblings out at out at a homestead at, at mill and saying yeah. no doctor you know just yeah. crazy so uh, that, that was in our thought process today and, and I, I get to thinking about that and how easy my my the other side of my family had it they had they had right he had Granddad Kennedy found shallow water, and they, they were not as challenged there as uh, on that place at Arch as they were in Fort Sumner. Right. So people started start, people started getting wells yep. drilled, and well, and uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that that um, um, that uh, Lindsay felt like was was that we could we could do irrigation in the in the valley mm-hmm. that. Uh, if we could get wells drilled, they felt like the they could get achieve artesian flow on the wells, which was you know where it would flow right. up out of the wellhead and and not not have to be pumped, which was what what was the case in Peca, in the Pecos Valley. But it never they they drilled test test sites. Uh, one of those was the well on, on the courthouse uh, square, and it never never it would rise in the well, but it would only so far. So it had to be pumped, you know. And they, so yeah. if you see early day, early day photos of downtown Portales, there right. were windmills in in downtown Portales right. because that was the 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 way of, of doing it. And that's you know, so our landscape uh, with all the um, uh, different homesteads, you had to have a windmill to to water sure. stock and stuff. And that's that was, but they felt like they could um, could. Uh, work out a, an irrigation district so that they could pump the water, put it into ditches. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then, so they, they set up the, the co-op system. So they, they, they basically, it, it cost, um, what they, what they, uh, uh, asked from each farmer that went into it was thir- thirty-one fifty an acre, $31 and 50 cents. That's huge. And they, w- they put 10,000 acres in it. This, this uh, allowed them to to get uh, a, a uh, company to to bring electric generators in so that they could run the pumps with electricity, and uh, so they got the first in 1910. They've got the first water flowing, and it was it was uh, too late in the year to get row crops, but they did have some alfalfa that they watered and got a crop on that. And they had a couple of uh, better years, uh, but it struggled. It yeah. didn't didn't do well. Uh, you know, even they they were still trying to figure out what How what would what would work as what far as crops here. and whatnot. And then uh, before they really got their the their feet under them with the uh, irrigation co op, the World War One broke mm-hmm. out, and the the generators then were were sold. Uh, they went they away went to the war and the, the whole thing. Uh, so the the folks that were in this, this, they either had to sell their land to uh, pay off their their debt to the co-op, or uh, try to try to figure out a different way. And and they were starting at that point to to uh, experiment with uh, uh, combustion engine uh, okay. pumping. And so that was eventually what what we what we got into uh, with uh, uh, with respect to what. What? what happened in the 20th century in the Portales Valley to, to get the water to we, get it? We irrigated, uh, you and you, you, you remember them? I do. We we had we had to uh, to to make sure that those were they had oil and you know the, the, you serviced them in yeah. regular periods and they ran all the time. Right, <laughs> and, and they would literally dig big reservoir pits yeah. and pump into that. Yeah, and then pump out of that into just long. Yeah irrigation rows mm-hmm. yeah and have tubes and i think we have some pictures and things of that of, well, of how they would and, and start that you siphoning. Know, by the you know by the time world war ii 
uh, we were really going strong with that. And that was the economic e engine for the for the whole uh, area was was irrigated farming. We have barely scratched the surface on this, Carl. I, I find this information so wonderful to have. Can you come back next week and let's let's finish and go into this a little further? Certainly. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, let's do. And to all of you out there watching, thank you, and we will see you next week. Cheers. Thank you.